From the Greenhouse, it's the Adam Ragusea Podcast, episode 63, and as part of a little string of, uh, I guess, alcohol-related episodes that we seem to be doing, I am going to tell you uh, today about why beer and similar beverages, alcoholic beverages, are generally a little more expensive in the United States than they need to be. In 32 of our 50 states, the law says that producers of alcoholic beverages generally cannot sell their products to the public, nor can they sell their products to retailers who would then sell the booze to the public. No, instead, the law dictates that brewers and distillers and winemakers and even importers generally may only sell their products to a special type of middleman. A middleman between other middlemen in some cases. You have to sell the wine or the beer or whatever you make to a wholesaler slash distributor. The wholesaler slash distributor then sells your product to bars and restaurants and liquor stores, and it is they, the retailers, the third tier of the system, who are finally allowed to actually sell your swill to the drinking public. Speaking of which... Mm. That is the three-tiered system of alcohol sales in the U.S., and it has been somewhat relaxed in recent years. Lots of states now have limited carve-outs and such so that wineries and brew pubs can sell a small amount of their own stuff on site and all that stuff, but that's a niche market. In the big alcohol markets, the world of your lawnmower beers, right? The three-tier system remains essentially in place, and I find it perpetually fascinating because on the surface, this system makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. Guy makes a legal product that people want, so he sells it to people who want it. Seems pretty simple. Seems like the core transaction of commerce and indeed of capitalism itself. Guy makes a thing. Guy sells it to other guy who wants it. What could be more simple? Why would government want to make it much, much, much less simple than that? That was one much for each of the three tiers, by the way. Like most things that lots of people do that don't seem to make any sense, there is a reason for the three-tiered system. It's just it's not a very good reason anymore, in my humble opinion. I'm going to tell you two stories about this today. The first story is the story of prohibition. How the United States came to ban alcohol entirely within its borders, only to reverse course a decade later and become what the U.S. is today, the country with the 38th highest alcohol sales by liter per capita, according to the World Health Organization. 38th highest might not seem very high, but consider who all is above us on that list. Russia, Ireland, France, Germany. Number one is Latvia, if you want to know. They drink about 13 liters of pure ethanol per capita every year in Latvia. In the U.S., we drink about 10 liters a year. Still a lot of booze, especially for a country that literally banned all alcohol just barely a century ago. What happened? What came over us? What made us snap out of it? That story is fascinating in its own right, and it explains why we're stuck with the stupid three-tier system today that enriches middlemen who add little value to the products that you and I ultimately pay for. Now, the second story that I'm going to tell you is about, uh, well... A struggling small business in Macon, Georgia, where I worked as a local reporter a long time ago. It's a story about some good guys who uh, just wanted to make some good beer and sell it to good people, and it ended up being a lot harder for them than it should have been. That second story features a cameo from one of the people whom Donald Trump would eventually blame for his 2020 election loss. It's weird how things are connected. Anyway, Prohibition. It's important to understand that prohibition was not a uniquely American movement. It was a global movement that just happened to go really far in one particular country. 
Kind of like Marxism. It would be simply incorrect to label Marxism as a Russian phenomenon. Similarly, it would be inaccurate to consider prohibition an American phenomenon. It was a global movement, the temperance movement. A few of the world's major jurisdictions either banned or greatly restricted alcohol sales, albeit briefly, right around the same time in the early 20th century, most notably the Russian Empire under Tsar Nicholas II. I am leaning here on a fantastic book that I read when it came out a couple of years ago called Smashing the Liquor Machine, A Global History of Prohibition. It is by a Villanova University political science professor named Mark Lawrence Schrad, a Russia specialist, I might add. His previous book was about uh, vodka and the Russian state. Now might be a good time to dust that one off the shelves. His more recent book is about prohibition as a global movement, and I will summarize it thusly. It actually has to do with Marxism, or rather, the broader social moment of the 19th and early 20th centuries into which Marxism was so well received. Right? People were really sick of being exploited by fat cats, and they were ready to use some extreme measures to level the playing field. It's the Industrial Revolution, right? Cities are gathering masses of poor people together to make widgets to enrich corporate and or colonial slash monarchical fat cats. All the while, you have the expansion of educated urban middle classes, informed, empowered young people ready and able to change the world. Dr. Schrad sees the temperance movement against alcohol as being part of that broader social liberation movement, and it's especially easy to see that in Russia, where the Tsar held a royal monopoly on the manufacture and sale of vodka. My American friends, if that sounds super communist to you, remember two things. One, the Tsar was not a communist, and two... You know what other government holds a state monopoly on the sale of alcohol? The People's Republic of North Carolina, my friends, and Pennsylvania and Virginia. There are 17 U.S. states that hold some kind of state monopoly on the sale of some kind of alcoholic beverages. Government monopolies on alcohol are very old and very common and not at all unique to the political milieu that would eventually produce the Soviet system. In Imperial Russia, which only ended like a hundred years ago, not that long ago, in Imperial Russia, the Tsar held a monopoly on vodka, the only industrially distilled spirit that was widely available in Russia at that time. Let's not forget what a boon the Industrial Revolution was to drunkenness. Industrial-scale distillation makes getting drunk so much quicker and easier and cheaper than getting drunk off of, you know traditional small-batch wine or beer or whatever. The introduction of vodka into the Slavic world, schnapps into the Germanic world, whiskey into the Anglo-Celtic world, etc., etc. These are all recorded as massive society-changing events in history. Mass-produced hard liquor changed everything. The vodka monopoly was, not surprisingly, incredibly profitable for the Russian monarchy, to the point where you'd have to call the Russian monarchy a vodka company that also happened to hold political sovereignty over its market territory. The Tsar was, in essence, a drug lord, military dictator of a narco-state. He built bigger and bigger palaces whilst penniless addicts scraped together enough rubles to buy their next fix from the Tsar. Russia remains, to this day, the large country with the highest rate of alcohol dependency, by far. And all the other countries at the top of that list are former Russian imperial possessions, with the exception of Hungary, which you could just call a Soviet imperial possession. Because just because they shoot the emperor doesn't mean it ain't still an empire. Hey, regarding current events... If you say that you're opposed to arming Ukraine because you are opposed to American imperialism, I definitely understand that. Like, I feel that too. But I mean, come on. Have you read about Russian imperialism? Like, given the choice, I'd choose American imperialism over Russian imperialism every single time. But then again, I'm American, so I would think that, wouldn't I? 
Anyway, the Russians campaigning against alcohol in the late imperial period were, they were not just the crazy religious conservatives. They were not just busybody wives who wanted to rein in their husband's fun. The organized lefties or proto-lefties in Russia hated vodka because vodka was the means by which an unelected, autocratic, hereditary aristocracy sucked all the wealth and productivity out of working people and left them too inebriated and addicted and broken to challenge that system. Why do men stupefy themselves, Tolstoy famously asked. While the U.S. was getting ready to fight its civil war, Russia fought its liquor war, the vodka protests of 1858-59. The Tsar had bankrupted himself, losing the Crimean War. Vodka was his main source of income, so he fixed his little problem by effectively tripling the price of vodka. Done and dusted, the Tsar thought. But this created an unlikely alliance between proto-lefty revolutionaries mad about kleptocracy and orthodox Christian conservatives who were mad about drunkenness and the dissolute behavior that ensues. And don't forget about the drunks who were mad about the price of vodka. All of these completely different Russians were on the same team all of a sudden, allied against the Tsar, and they expressed their anger very effectively with an organized boycott of vodka, which deprived the Tsar of income. So, of course, he just absolutely had to use his army against his own people and suppress the protests. The spice must flow. Frank Herbert could uh, sure sum up a complicated concept in a nutshell, couldn't he? You know what other good thing comes in a nutshell? Peely Hunters, Peely Nuts, sponsor of this episode. And the world's healthiest nut, they say, and they make a good case for it. The Peely tree is a tropical evergreen from the Philippines. It makes these little fruits that look kind of like mussels, you know, the shellfish. And the seed inside that little fruit mussel is the Peely Nut, which has been a major source of protein and healthy fats for Filipino people since, like, forever. The raw nut can be used as a laxative, So when you don't want a laxative, which is probably most of the time, uh, you roast or you otherwise cook peely nuts and they taste like, well, let's see. Macadamia nut is the closest analog that I could think of because the oil is just so sweet. But texturally, it is richer than that. It's crunchy on the outside and it's almost creamy on the inside. Like people have compared the interior to foie gras. Lots of healthy fatty acids, lots of magnesium and copper and manganese and zinc, thanks to the volcanic soil that they grow in. And they're so rich that they are a very filling snack with a great like weight to calorie ratio if you need to pack light for a hike or something. And the best thing is, Peely Hunters are a much more sustainable option compared to lots of other nuts. You've probably heard of all of the water wasted on almond production in California. That's not an issue with Peely Nuts because they they do not lack for rain in the Philippines. The nuts are naturally pollinated, they're grown without pesticides or fertilizers, and Peely Hunters come roasted in all kinds of absolutely terrific flavors. Check them out at uh, eatpeelynuts.com and use code REGUSIA to get a 20% discount. There's a link in the description, which is eatpeelynuts.com slash discount slash REGUSIA. I think the classic flavor is my favorite, which is the, the Himalayan salt and coconut oil, but the rosemary and olive oil is great. Spicy chili is really great. Uh, eatpeelynuts.com slash discount slash REGUSIA. My code REGUSIA will get you 20% off. And I highly recommend them. Thank you, Peely Hunters. Anyway, in 1858, a grassroots campaign to boycott the Tsar's vodka swept Russia. And the Tsar put it down with military force because he needed to sell poison to his own people in order to make their money. That was Tsar Alexander II, who fancied himself a reformer. Tsar Nicholas also fancied himself a reformer. And when he could make common cause with more moderate liberal forces in late imperial Russia, he would. Though that's probably not the main reason that he pushed the dry law 
1914 that banned all liquor sales outside of restaurants in Russia. Nicholas mostly wanted to sober up the nation to improve its chances in the First World War. Displeasure over the dry law may have contributed to the Russian Revolution, and the loss of revenue to the monarchy definitely contributed to the revolution, but whoo boy, if you thought Nicholas was a buzzkill, meet the guy you're going to end up with at the end of the revolution, Lenin. Lenin hated alcohol. I mean, he liked a little for himself now and then, but he hated you having any alcohol. He saw alcohol as one of the three big tools of the bourgeoisie to weaken the proletariat, the other two big tools being tobacco and religion. Damn it, Lenin. Don't make me agree with you on something. Anyway, when the Bolsheviks took over, they maintained the dry law. They were all about it. It wasn't until Lenin died and Stalin took over and Stalin was like, well... I'm basically the emperor now, so why am I broke? Oh, it's because we got rid of the imperial vodka monopoly during the Great War. Well, let's bring it back. Now we can call it the people's vodka monopoly, and the state will still pocket all the money because, theoretically, the state is the people now. But really, the state is just me, Joseph Stalin, very solid contender for worst person in history. So that was Russia's 11-year fling with limited prohibition. You could still drink at a restaurant, you just couldn't take it home with you. Mm. Oh, wash that down. Prohibition mingled with people's liberation movements all over the world in the late 19th, early 20th centuries. In India, in China, in Ireland, boycotting alcohol became a way of boycotting the Brits, boycotting colonialism. Colonialism existed in large measure to produce sugar, and sugar production existed in large measure to create rum. Plus, among Europeans, alcohol became a self-reinforcing moral justification for imperialism. The Brits or the Dutch or whoever would pull up into a new country where the local population was totally unaccustomed to alcohol. They would sell them alcohol and the locals would get drunk for the first time in the history of their society and lose their minds. And then the Europeans would say, oh, look, these people are so uncivilized. They need us to govern them. Ah, well, we can we can make it worth our while by continuing to sell them alcohol. Boy, yeah, look how uncivilized they are. I wonder why that is. Colonialism and imperialism, man, it's a, it's a pretty ugly system. You can drain the system of money if you refuse to buy the poison. And if you stop taking the poison, you'll sober up and become more capable of revolution and ultimately self-government. How in the hell did the United States ban all alcohol sales, restaurant-based or otherwise? Because for this particular moment and regarding this one topic, there existed a fleeting mutuality between progressives and social reformers and abolitionists and religious conservatives and busybody buzzkills. All of those people believed for their own reasons that alcohol should be banned. Prohibition and liberation were already intertwined in the U.S. because some of the first prohibitionists of note were indigenous Americans, whose tribes had been absolutely ravaged by the rapid introduction of the white man's poison. Also, prohibitionists were abolitionists and vice versa. Frederick Douglass promised Lincoln that he would secure black support for prohibition. In part, this was probably a political exchange, but Douglas also preached against alcohol with conviction. Douglas used to say that the slave master abuses his slaves Monday through Friday, but then gives them liquor on Saturday to ease their pains and keep them compliant. And then, of course, temperance slash prohibition also got totally intertwined with women's liberation. Everywhere in the world, alcohol consumption is far higher among men. In part, this is because men tend to be bigger, so it takes more to get us buzzed, but alcoholism, like medical alcohol dependency, is also far higher among men on average. When we talk about a place like Russia having an alcoholism rate over 20% these days, 
Here's how that breaks down by gender, according to the World Health Organization. 7% of Russian women are alcoholics. 37% of Russian men are alcoholics. That is astounding. In the U.S., it's 17% of men, which is still atrocious. 10% among U.S. women, by the way. Not as big of a gender difference there. Side note, good Lord, why? Why are Russian men so broken? I mean, we talked last week about how there's there's little, if any, evidence that Russians and other Slavs are more genetically susceptible to alcoholism as compared to any other white people. Alcoholism seems to be mostly a social thing on the old Eastern Bloc. Here's a quote from a British-slash-Russian study of Russian alcoholism from 2011. Quote, It has been argued that men in Russia were particularly vulnerable to changes in work and social life that occurred in the early post-Soviet transition period. This is because Russians hold neo-traditional conceptions of family life and masculinity and perceive a strict division of the domestic and wage-earning spheres. Men who become unemployed lose their core social and familial identity of breadwinner and may be more likely to drink to compensate for the loss of status. Status. These arguments are supported by data showing that men with lower education who are unmarried and unemployed are more likely to be problem drinkers and have higher mortality rates. End quote. Point is, guys, the patriarchy is literally killing you. Let it go. And if drinking hurts the men who do it, wow, do they turn around and hurt their families either actively through abuse or passively through neglect of responsibilities. As access to industrially distilled spirits grew all over the world, women got real tired of dealing with the constant fallout. And what was worse, women had no political power to influence a crucial question of public policy that would profoundly affect the traditional domain of women, the home. So, temperance and prohibition got all wrapped up in the women's suffrage movement. You want to know something crazy that I learned from Dr. Schrad's book about all of uh, the stuff we've been talking about? Get this. So, prohibition in the United States did not begin in 1919 with the passage of the 18th Amendment banning alcohol nationwide. Prohibition actually had begun in 1907 when states in a certain area of the country started passing their own state-level laws known as the Dry Wave. Which region of the United States voluntarily got out ahead on banning alcohol? You want to shout out some guesses? It was the South. It was here. There existed a fleeting moment of mutuality between white and black Southerners regarding this one narrow issue. The traditional historical narrative in the U.S. tells us that white Southerners were quite keen to ban alcohol because they were just... They were just terrified of newly emancipated black men getting drunk and then causing big trouble for the white population. And that anxiety definitely did exist at the time, but Mark Lawrence Strad challenges that traditional historical narrative a bit in his book. He says that white Southerners had reasons for wanting to ban alcohol among their own, among white people. Pretty much all the reasons we've been talking about so far. And unlike the North which had huge entrenched liquor industries, the South was much less industrialized, so there was not as big of a pro-liquor, pro-business lobby fighting prohibition. The point is, religious and social conservatism of the day, which was opposed to alcohol, kind of lined up on this one issue with the revolutionary radicalism of the day, which opposed the alcohol trade as a kind of predatory capitalism. And that is how the U.S. went crazy for a second and banned alcohol with a constitutional amendment in 1919. Requires a lot of consensus to pass a constitutional amendment in the U.S. Then all hell broke loose, as you've apparently seen in a million old gangster movies, probably. The U.S. was completely unprepared to enforce prohibition. In the cities, 
organized crime was right there to start up an absolutely massive underground liquor industry, and in places like where I am now, the mountains of East Tennessee, well, people took matters into their own hands and uh, made their own bathtub swill. I have got to do a video about the history of bootlegging around here, because the legendary like Thunder Road is literally right there from where I am right now. I gotta do that video. Anyway, in 1929, the stock market crashed and all that tax revenue to be generated by legal alcohol sales suddenly looked very attractive to the U.S. government. And it was clear by then that everybody who was going to drink was going to drink, whether it was legal or not. And so the nation said, screw it. Let's go back to the way things were before. The 21st Amendment passed in 1933 repealing prohibition. But there was a problem that should sound familiar to observers of the contemporary drug war. In banning alcohol, the U.S. had created a massive and highly profitable illegal alcohol industry. They could not simply put that underground industry back into the bottle now. Because a fellow who wanted to have a drink had very little motivation to buy it legally. You buy it legally, you have to pay taxes on it. Taxes were the whole point of re-legalizing alcohol in the first place. So, government people knew that they had to do something to take back control of this industry. And one of the methods they came up with was the three-tier system. We're going to make things simpler to enforce by just saying that nobody who makes or imports alcohol can sell it to anyone. Or rather, the producer cannot sell it directly to the consumer. That had become a much more common model during Prohibition. The speakeasy makes the gin in the back and sells it to the people out front who are maybe gambling in our little illegal casino. It's all, it's all vertically integrated on site, and nobody has to know what goes on inside these walls. Or maybe there was a two-tiered system where a brewer or a distiller would make stuff and then sell it to a saloon to sell to the public. That was very common pre-prohibition. And it created what a lot of people considered to be an, uh, an unhealthy system of so-called tied houses, a saloon with a financial or contractual tie with an alcohol producer, right? Lots of saloons would agree to carry one guy's beer exclusively, or, or maybe that brewer would pay the saloon owner a rebate to push his beer. And this, this resulted in a market that was hostile to new entrants. And people argued it resulted in more drinking because it put retailers under extra pressure to maximize sales. So when they ended prohibition, certain state governments said, okay, we're going to create a whole new alcohol distribution industry, and we may or may not stack this industry with ourselves and our fat cat friends who can profit off of the laws that we pass in the state legislature when no one is looking. We're going to create a whole new distribution industry that will be independent of any producers or retailers. Therefore, it won't favor one brand or one bar over another. And this distribution industry will also create like a choke point where we, the government, can more easily monitor the industry and tax its products. Everything is going to go through the distributors, and the distributors are our buddies. They'll help us count the liquor so that we can tax it. The distributors are basically private tax collectors. So that's how a lot of the U.S. got the three-tier system. Producer slash importer sells to distributor who sells to retailer. Retailer eventually sells to you. So there's just so many steps. So much of a paper trail to be examined by regulators. In other states, the government wrestled control of the liquor industry by becoming the liquor industry. That's how you got states like North Carolina and my native Pennsylvania, where the government directly owns and operates all the liquor stores. And they're usually really nice liquor stores in Pennsylvania. Love the state-run stores. They seem very well run and as responsibly run as a liquor store can be. These days, the government has a pretty firm handle on the American alcohol industry. There's not a lot of bootlegging going on, probably because 
industrial efficiency has made even heavily taxed alcohol cheaper than most any bootlegged product, and people heard about how homemade moonshine can make you blind and stuff, so they just started going to the liquor store instead of, you know, driving up some terrifying mountain road to visit their local bootlegger. And yet, more than half of the states still have the three-tier system to this day, because the distributors give tons of money to state politicians. The distributors don't want any new laws to threaten the good thing they have going. They don't want to make alcohol or sell it to people. The distributors only have to take the bottles from one place to another, and the producers and the retailers are legally required to pay distributors to do it. Is that such a bad thing? Do small brewers really want to be in the business of owning warehouses and fleets of trucks to handle their own distribution? I imagine that a startup brewery would love some help moving units. But it's more complicated than that, and I'll explain right after I move some units for Element, sponsor of this episode. Get a free sample pack of Element's delicious zero-sugar electrolyte drinks with any purchase at drinklmnt.com slash Adam. It is summer, and I am gardening a lot, and working outside, and sweating, and I am loving grapefruit season with Element. This is their limited summertime grapefruit salt flavor, available now. It is true that lots of people probably generally eat too much salt, but there's surprisingly a strong case to be made for a lot of us getting a lot more salt at certain times, such as when we are sweating through extended periods of hard exercise or manual labor or being outside in Tennessee at summer. You bleed salt through your sweat, and then your electrolytes get out of whack. You need to replenish your sodium and your magnesium and your potassium. If you don't, you won't be able to fully rehydrate no matter how much water you drink. Plus, as any athlete knows, being down on electrolytes feels absolutely terrible. You lose muscle control. You get headaches. It's really bad. Another category of people who may be electrolyte deficient is people on certain highly restrictive diets, because most people get most of their sodium these days from ultra-processed foods, and if you cut those out all at once, you could be sodium deficient. That's probably part of the like keto flu that people talk about. And electrolyte drinks are amazing when you are sick, too. That is the best. Problem is, they often come with a ton of calories and other stuff that you might not want. That's what makes Element different. Each little packet of highly water-soluble powder only contains a few simple ingredients. It's got stevia for sweetening instead of sugar, natural flavors, and the electrolytes themselves, of course, and that's pretty much it. You got to try yourself a glass of Element. Get the uh, grapefruit flavor while it lasts this summer. Mm. You can get uh, no questions asked refunds on any order, and you can get a free flavor sample pack with any purchase by using my link, which is drinklmnt.com slash Adam. Drinklmnt.com slash Adam. Thank you, Element. So, wouldn't a small liquor producer be quite happy to have somebody else distribute their product as is legally required in half of the U.S.? Well, let me tell you, today's second story. It's a tragedy about an ambitious, optimistic local startup with a cameo from a politician who went on to play a big role in the drama of Donald Trump's 2020 election loss. The last part is just a bonus. So, 2012, I moved to this small city an hour and a half south of Atlanta called Macon, Georgia. I got a local reporting job there that intrigued me because it was attached to this big grant-funded project at Mercer University to reimagine local journalism and save it. I was very much a yuppie at the time, in the original meaning of the word, young urban professional. I liked to spend my time drinking and having fun in a vibrant downtown area. Lots of American downtowns had rejuvenated by 2012, or gentrified, depending on how you look at it. 
lots of American downtowns were full of new bars and restaurants and such by 2012, but Macon was still really struggling. Macon is very poor, and for various historical reasons, Macon has an absolutely gigantic downtown area relative to the surrounding population size, and so that's a lot of old buildings for not a lot of people to buy and spend millions of dollars fixing up. It looked to me, in 2012, like downtown Macon was just on the verge of popping the way that I'd seen other downtowns pop, and I wanted to be part of a new thing, so I took that job in Macon. And one of the first stories that I covered in detail over many months was the struggles of the Macon Beer Company. Macon Beer Company was just a couple of well-educated, young, beardy dudes, an educational psychologist and an HVAC engineer, couple of beardy, brainy friends who loved beer and they loved Macon, so they figured they could do what has been done successfully in so many other cities, and that is to start a downtown microbrewery. They got a warehouse space in the now mostly deserted former red light district of Macon down by the railroad tracks, and they built a brewery with their own hands and they started making beer. They were proud to be at the leading edge of the coming downtown renaissance, which did end up happening in Macon, by the way, just not quite fast enough to save Macon Beer Company. They had real trouble making money, and one problem was the three-tier system. Back then, there were only a handful of operating restaurants downtown that would be interested in selling local Macon beer. And the most cost-effective thing for the Macon Beer Company guys to do would have been to load up a keg of their beer and drive it three blocks to the Rookery or to Downtown Grill or wherever they're going to sell it. But the Macon Beer Company guys couldn't do that. They had to sell their beer to a distributor who would drive down to Macon, pick up the beer, drive it up to a warehouse in Atlanta, then drive it back down to Macon again to sell it to the Rookery, and then to eventually sell to me on tap. That was obviously insane on so many levels, and it sucked a ton of money out of the system. If Macon Beer Company could have just sold their stuff directly to restaurants, they would have gotten to keep more of the money, and that would have helped them to survive their first few years as total urban pioneers. And I do think the term urban pioneer is fitting here and not problematic in this case, because Macon Beer Company did not displace anyone when they moved into that warehouse by the tracks. There was nothing down there. Nothing had been down there for decades. The Macon Beer Company guys also figured that they could survive their first few years by maybe selling beer directly to the public, on site, a tap room at the brewery. Budweiser doesn't need that to survive, but a small brewer really might, and they can't do it under the three-tier system. As the microbrewery trend has grown in the U.S., lots of states have passed limited exceptions to their three-tier laws, precisely for situations like this. Let the brew pub sell their own beer, as long as it's not happening at a level of production that would threaten the likes of Budweiser. Anheuser-Busch and Budweiser have massive, politically powerful operations in Georgia. Back in 2012, there was no such legal carve-out in Georgia that would have helped out Macon Beer Company. There was a proposal under consideration at the legislature, but it didn't seem to be moving. So I, a reporter, I called up the state legislator who chaired the committee in which this idea of, of a limited exception for microbrewers was kind of languishing. It was languishing in his committee. So I called this guy and I said, so Senator... What's the best argument for keeping the three-tier system around today? I mean, what function does it serve now that we don't have terrible bootlegging problems anymore? I asked that question as nicely as I could, and the guy just had nothing. Like, I'm looking at my old story right now, which is still online, and... Whenever I report on a controversy, I, I really pride myself on looking for the best arguments from both sides, because that's what I want to hear. Why do people support this thing? Why are they persuaded? What's the best argument in favor of it? That's what I want to present to my audience. That approach is not false equivalence. It's just fairness, I think. But man... 
The people who try to protect the three-tier system now seem to have no good argument. Like, this was the best quote I was able to beat out of that state senator. He said, uh, quote, The three-tier system has been in place for, what, 80 years now? And what it was designed to do, what it is designed to do, is regulate an industry that needs regulating. That was the best he had. I asked follow-ups, like, how? How does the system regulate the industry? Other states have a two-tier system, and they seem to be able to tax alcohol just fine. Eddie Coyle isn't still driving semi-trucks of stolen Canadian club over the border. So why do we still need the three-tier system? North Carolina has a state monopoly on liquor sales, but they also passed an exception for microbreweries back in the 1980s. And that's why North Carolina is the Oregon of the South for its vibrant craft beer scene. This guy, the legislator, just had nothing, no argument at all for perpetuating the three tiers. He just rephrased that empty platitude about how it, it regulates an industry that needs regulating. So what could I do? I just, I printed his weak ass quote and I pointed out to the audience that he had received campaign contributions from the distributor lobby and that was that. Then one day, my editor up in Atlanta assigns me to go to Macon Beer Company and cover a visit by then Georgia Secretary of State Brian Kemp. That name will sound familiar to you if you have followed Republican Party politics over the last few years. Secretary of State is a confusing job title because it means something completely different at the state level than it does at the federal level. The U.S. Secretary of State is like the head diplomat of the federal government, concerned exclusively with foreign affairs, and the office is appointed by the president. In state-level government in the U.S., the Secretary of State is often directly elected by the people, as in the case of Kemp in Georgia, and the Secretary of State is not a diplomat at the state level. It's a glorified clerk position at the state level. The Secretary of State is the custodian of state government records and such, and they often administer elections, as in the case of Georgia. So why was Brian Kemp... Georgia Secretary of State at the time, why was he touring the Macon Beer Company? We figured that maybe he had heard about all of the regulatory trouble and was coming to lend some political or administrative assistance to Georgia's struggling craft brewers. I was sent to cover the event. I followed the tour with my microphone. Kemp listened through the tour politely, though somewhat disinterestedly. If you've never seen Brian Kemp before, picture a guy who looks basically like George W. Bush, same manicured salt and pepper hair, same suspiciously clean and pressed plaid work shirt tucked into his suspiciously clean and pressed blue jeans to make him look like he's one of the guys, but still elite enough to tell the other guys what to do. My honest impression of Kemp at the time was of an amiable dummy in the mold of W, though slightly less dumb and a lot less naturally amiable. Because, you know, for all of W's tragic flaws, Bush is a man of uncommonly high emotional intelligence, at least as applied to small group settings. W is amazing in the room with you. Less so in front of a big crowd, but he's amazing at being in the room with you and making you feel valued and heard. Kemp is less good at that. He's practiced, so he knows how to go through the motions of empathy and stuff. <laughs> in all the times that I've seen Brian Kemp directly in action, it rarely read as sincere to me. I, of course, didn't say that out loud back when I was a straight news reporter, but I think I can tell you my honest opinions now. Anyway, Brian Kemp took his little tour of the struggling Macon Beer Company, and he asked a few questions because he clearly knew that he was supposed to ask a few questions, and he, he made a few relatable asides about how much he likes beer, and that was that. Time for questions from the assembled press corps, which was me and this guy Phil from the paper. I have a question, Mr. Secretary. Why are you here visiting the Macon Beer Company today? And Kemp said something like, well... As Georgia Secretary of State, it's my responsibility to register all of the businesses in Georgia. 
And that's true, by the way, though it is purely an administrative function. So he said he has this he has this role of registering businesses, and he thought that he should travel around the state a bit to hear from small businesses about their concerns. And it was then that I realized Brian Kemp was not actually here to help the Macon Beer Company guys or anybody else. This was an unofficial, state-funded campaign stop, like the kind dudes like that make all the time. He said that, and I thought to myself, oh, I see. You're going to run for governor in a few years, and you figured that you would take an official tour of small businesses of the state so that you could boost your statewide name recognition or whatever. For what it's worth, I don't necessarily think that's bad. The beauty of representative democracy is that it can still work pretty well, even when it's a little corrupt. Because how does an ambitious guy like Brian Kemp scheme and con his way into the governor's office? Well, by doing things like shaking the hands of small business owners all over the state, which is a good ritual for a guy like Kemp to go through because it will probably make him more responsive to an incredibly important constituency like small business owners. Anyway, a few years after all that happened, Brian Kemp got elected governor of Georgia and the three-tier system remains essentially in place, though the legislature has relaxed a few of the old liquor laws and that's made things a little easier for brewers and such, perhaps a little too late for Macon Beer Company. They struggled for a while, then there was a change in ownership, and they opened a great brew pub downtown, but by then there were like 10 other brew pubs in downtown Macon all of a sudden, riding on Macon Beer Company's coattails downtown, and I have no direct insider knowledge of what happened, but Macon Beer Company closed down the pub in December. Pour one out. Then this crazy thing happened where Donald Trump, the loud guy on the TV with the funny hair, Donald Trump got elected president of the United States in 2016. Trump and Kemp endorsed each other's campaigns, because, of course, when Trump came up for re-election in 2020, he lost. And then he made a bunch of wild claims about widespread election fraud. There probably is a little election fraud in the U.S., but it's probably not widespread enough to have tipped the decision at all in this case, and regardless, Trump's claims of fraud were completely unmoored from reality. He could have come up with some vaguely plausible-sounding claims of voter fraud based on some tiny kernel of actual truth. You yeah, know, the way a normal politician lies. But Trump is the new kind of politician who doesn't even bother to make his lies plausible, in part because he can't be bothered to learn enough facts to make his lies plausible. He just said, hey, I lost the presidency because I lost Georgia. Who's in charge of Georgia? Republicans are in charge of Georgia, right? Why can't one of those guys find me the Georgia votes that I need to win the presidency. Yes, Trump literally said, find the votes. Georgia's new Secretary of State, who actually ran the election, Brad Raffensperger, bravely stood up to Trump's probably illegal attempt to bully and extort Georgia into finding the right votes. Governor Brian Kemp stood up to Trump, somewhat less bravely, though stood up he did nonetheless, I suppose. My honest opinion of Kemp now is that he is not the most loathsome governor in the U.S., but he's, he's up against some stiff competition. Of course, I never would have said that back when I worked for mainstream news organizations for two reasons. One, because I, I would not have wanted to make trouble for my colleagues. And two, because I really, I really did find that it helped me to do my job better if I did not take personal positions on controversial political questions. I think that old rule for certain kinds of reporters really does exist for a reason. I may still be a journalist of some kind now, but I don't think I'm a reporter anymore. Am I becoming a monologist of some kind? Seems like I'm heading in that direction lately. Well, thank you for heading in the direction of the Ragusia pod. Hey, we're going to be doing our uh, Ask the Dairy Farmer episode soon. So anything you've always wanted to ask someone with like ridiculously deep knowledge of the dairy industry, 
put it in an email, send it to askadamquestions at gmail.com. The farmer's name is Manjeet, so put Manjeet in the subject line. M-A-N-J-I-T. Manjeet. Good guy, Manjeet. Make good choices. Try to avoid those opiates of the masses as long as doing so doesn't interfere with your consumption of my content. Talk to you next time.